Hello everybody, welcome back to another Gregorious Maths video. In this video, I'm opening up a new series, Theorem of the Week. And of course, what better theorem to start with than the famous Hairy Ball Theorem. And of course, that's a, an amusing name. Um, but it's quite a nice theorem as well anyway, so um, I thought, you know, the combination of those two factors would make it a good way to start off theorem of the week. So I'll um, state the formal, I'll state it formally, I'll give some, a little bit of intuition about how to prove it and then I'll, but kind of at the set, I, you know, I'm not going to pretend that I have a strict plan, let's just go with the flow. So let me state the hairy ball theorem. Theorem. Hairy ball theorem. So what does it say? like rigorously speaking. And this, I'm gonna prove it for the two sphere because I can easily draw that out, but it generalizes to any even dimensional sphere. Um, so, any vector, continuous vector field, continuous vector field, V, um, S2. Um, that is tangent to the circle, uh, to the circle, to the sphere. Tangent to the sphere. Um, must have at least one point that vanishes. So that is v of the sum, there is some v of p equal to zero. Um, and so actually, which makes this pretty cool, is that we can actually use ideas from homotopy theory, which um, I discussed in my last talk as well. Um, and in the spirit of Brouwer, if you watch the talk, spirit of Brouwer, we will be using degree theory in order to prove this. And... The way in which we will use degree theory, roughly, is that we will use a contradiction to basically find a homotopy between the identity on S2 and the antipodal map. That is, everybody that sends it to, you know, x goes to negative x, the antipodal map. Um, and we'll find a homotopy like this. However, this is a contradiction because actually the degree of the identity is equal to 1, but the degree of the antipodal map on any even dimensional sphere, so um, S to N, is minus 1. And therefore, because they don't have the same degree, this must be false, and so our original statement must have been false. So basically we have to get to this, because that's the idea. Um, and so I'll do that first, and then I might talk a little bit about degrees. Um, so yeah, let's do that first. And now I'm going to draw a sphere. I'm going to attempt to draw a sphere at least. Um, so if we have something... My god, that was a bad attempt. Uh, something... Okay, that's a bit better. Yeah, that's a good sphere. Let me just draw it nice and big, now that I know how to actually draw it. If we have a sphere... I should probably draw that nicer. Okay, yes, we've, I've drawn a good sphere here. Now, if we have a sphere like this... Okay, let's put, pick a point P... Um, Pick a point P, um, and we'll have this um, vector here, P. We'll call it P, and it goes from the origin to P. Now, our vector field V will have some orthogonal vector V of P. So it will look something like this, V of P. Now, the origin, the point, and this 
V of P, this vector V of P, they give us a unique plane which intersects this sphere, which we can draw on like this. If I draw it on like so, and if we look at it, we'll see we have our plane. If we look at just this plane in greater detail, which is the unique one which goes through the origin and intersects the sphere and contains P and V of P. We have this uh, plane like this. We have orthonormal, an orthonormal basis. So V of P and P form an orthonormal basis. That is, they are parallel to um, our space. That is, okay, so let's say we have V of, so basically it will look like this. So we'll have um, V of P say like this and we'll have P like this and what we can do once we're here is assuming that V of P has no vanishing points we can in fact define a homotopy which I'll define more rigorously but our homotopy which will be defined by going along this circle and we're going to make the assumption that V of P is normalized so uh, v some like this, and we can make uh, obviously this is not going to be true if there is a vanishing point, but okay, um, and we can go across all the way to negative p, and this will be our this will be our homotopy, and we're going to define this shortly. So what have we done? We've got on our plane here which we managed to get by intersecting the sphere with um, the origin, the point P, and our vector V of P, which is tangent by our hypothesis. And, okay, so it's tangent to our point P. And these have formed an orthonormal basis, so these two are tangential to each other. Um, they form an orthonormal basis for this plane, and um, in this plane, and assuming that V of P is nowhere vanishing, um, that is contradicting this statement, we can define a homotopy, which I'll define more rigorously in a second, we can define a homotopy which goes from P all the way via this V of P, this V, the spec field, across to minus P. And this would be, this will define a homotopy between the identity and the antipodal map, but of course because we're working in the two-sphere, this will not be true. So let me define this map more rigorously now. Um, hopefully that explanation made sense. Let me define this map more rigorously. We'll range it between 0 and 1, although some texts will range it from 0 to pi, that's completely fine, it's just a little bit abnormal. So we'll have our f, call it ft, and we'll take it from the sphere to, cross 0 plus 1 to the sphere, and how will it be defined? Well, we'll have some P, T, we'll get mapped to, um, our first coordinate will be cosine of pi T times P, then our second coordinate, um, actually, do you know what I'm, oh, right, 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 right. Because P is already part, okay, yeah. It's times P, and then we're gonna add, because P is a point on the sphere, so I can, so this is go, um, gonna land in our sphere. Plus sine pi T times P, sorry, times V of P over the magnitude of V of P. And we're assuming this is normalized, so. This is cosine of pi t, p plus sine of pi t, v of p. Although I'm pretty sure this proof would work just as well, even if you don't assume that this is normalized. Um, whoops. But this map is just looks a little bit more aesthetically pleasing. So we have this map, and what is this map? This map is 
I claim, a homotopy between the identity and the antiposal map. And this is very easy to prove because F0 of P is equal to, well, cosine of 0 is 1, so we have P, plus sine of 0 is 0, so it's just P. So F0 is the identity, and F1 of P is equal to, well, cosine of pi is now negative 1, so you have negative P, and cosine of, sorry, sine of pi is 0, so F1 is indeed the antipodal map. And therefore, assuming, of course, that V of P is um, continuous and does not have, so does not have, so we're contradicting the statement, does not have at least one point that vanishes, then this is going to define a nice continuous homotopy. However, the reflection map has a degree of minus one, which you can see if you think about the homology of a sphere. Um, if you think about the homology of a sphere um, and you break into two different generators, the, hem the top hemisphere and the bottom, and those are homeomorphic to simplicial complexes, so you can get the generators to look something like delta 1 minus delta 2. And the reflection map, all that will do is it will flip the sign, and so the degree will be minus 1. But because the antipodal map is just a composition of a bunch of different reflections, and it's easy to prove that the degree of a composition is just the multiplication of the degrees, that is, degree of f composed g is equal to the degree of f times the degree of g. And actually, this just follows because it's a homeomorphism. Sorry, a homeomorphism. Um, because everybody involved is a homeomorphism. And thus, um, because being a, a composition of reflection maps, we have that the general case is that the degree of the antipodal map on the sphere is equal to minus 1 to the n and so sorry sorry it's equal to n plus 1 right 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 n plus 1 because we've got, we're dealing with n plus 1 coordinates um, and so because the degree of the antipodal map is this when n is even the degree will be negative and thus we'll have a contradiction because the degree because the degree of the degree of the identity on the S2n is equal to 1, but that's not equal to the degree of the antipodal map on S2n, which is equal to minus 1. And so we have that the degrees are not equal, and therefore the identity on this is not homotopic to the antipodal map and therefore we have a contradiction because we just defined an identity and so the part that must have been wrong was this must have had a vanishing point which would make the whole homotopy um, not continuous, not well defined, um, meaning that any continuous vector field tangent to the sphere must have at least one point that vanishes because it will form this orthonormal basis, and if it didn't vanish, we could get a homotopy between the antipodal map and the identity, which for even spheres, even dimensional spheres, is not the case. Now, you might be wondering, so that's the proof, that's the proof done. Hopefully it makes sense. If it didn't make sense, maybe just rewind, rewatch. Um, but I think that makes sense. Hopefully it makes sense. Um, now, on to some... A uh, funny little tidbit about why it's called the Harry Ball Theorem. I believe it's called, I mean, my theory is that the original people that came up with it, I don't remember who it is, my theory is that they wanted to do something funny, like the Cox Zucker machine, which is another funny thing which you can look up for yourself. Um, but anyway, the Harry Ball Theorem, it's, it's got a genuine reason for the name, and that is the physical interpretation of this statement here is that if you have a hairy ball, so you have a, bun a 
nice sphere, perfect sphere with a bunch of hairs, you can never perfectly comb it. There will always be one, at least one hair, because those are vectors, of course. Um, you can think of them as vectors. There will always be one hair that sticks up. So, you know, never try to perfectly comb your hair. There will always be one that sticks up. Never try to perfectly comb a sphere. There will always be one that sticks up. There will always be a hair that sticks up. Um, so that's, I think, I think these are called cowlicks. That's what it said on Wikipedia. Um, but yeah, that's the physical interpretation. That's why it's called the hairy ball theorem. Um, and yeah, that's just kind of amusing. But this is the proper mathematics. This is the proof. I actually was impressed myself with my drawing skills. Um, hopefully I impressed you too with my drawing skills. And um, yeah, that's theorem of the week number one. Hopefully this is a good idea. Thank you guys for watching.